Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to New Zor Education. Um, so today I would like to talk about equations which are basically the fundamental laws of electromagnetic field. <coughs> well, first of all, I would like to actually give some kind of a credit to a very important man in this particular um, part of the physics, James Maxwell. Um, there are Maxwell equations. Basically, these are four fundamental equations which are describing the electromagnetic field. Well, in as much as three laws of Newton are describing mechanics, kinematics, din dynamics, etc. So it's very, very important. And these equations are very important not only for electromagnetic field description, but also they gave the push to the whole contemporary physics, basically, which includes relativity, even quantum mechanics. So, I'm not going to, <laughs> to present these four fundamental Maxwell equations in their total complexity, with proofs, etc., etc. However, I will try to give you, first of all, the feeling of all these equations are all about, and, uh, well, derive certain equations in certain simple cases. So that just gives you a flavor of whatever we are talking about. So today I will talk about one particular equation, the first equation, which actually kind of, well, it, it goes from the Coulomb law, which we all know about electrostatics. So we're talking about only electricity, no magnetism, just electricity. And we're talking about electric charges and what kind of electric field they create. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about Coulomb's law. So that law states the following. Uh, if you have two charges, Q1 and Q2, and um, they are at certain distance r, then the force would be proportional to product of these charges. Now, um, the force can be either attracting, if these charges are of opposite sign, or um, repealing, if they are of the same, positive and positive, or negative and negative. So these are basically charges themselves. Now we are talking about the electric field. So this is something like a, a force on a distance, because there is nothing in between these two charges, which actually like a spring pulls them together or repels them. So this is something related to a concept of field, which we were talking about before. Um, it's basically part of the space where certain forces are acting. Um, and the sources of these forces are not immediately touching the objects of these forces. So, right now we are talking about a particular force which is, well, created, if you wish, by any charge. So, if there is some kind of a charge, a single charge, the Q, it creates the force which acts on everything around it everything electrically charged around it. Now, we have certain characteristics of the field which basically describes what kind of a force this is. It's called uh, ele electric field intensity. So electric field intensity would, would be proportional, obviously, to this particular Q. And um, it also this same constant k, and it will be inversely proportional to distance, and that's how we describe something which is called um, intensity of the electric field. So if you want to know the force which acts on a particular charge, you do this. Now, these are two different. This is a source charge, and this is some kind of an object charge. 
All right. Well, I think I prefer zero to have here and here without any signs at all. Okay, so this is the source of the field. R is the distance from the source of the field to a particular point charge. We're talking about point charges right now. And then the force can be described as this one. So you have intensity of the field times charge. So intensity is basically the, the force which acts on a unit charge. That's why when you multiply it by Q, you will get the force. Now, what's important is these are vectors. Now, direction of these vectors in case of point charges is always radial from a point to a point. Okay, great. So we have defined the intensity of the field, which is basically the most important characteristic of any field. In this case, we are talking about electric field. So intensity is basically the force which can act on a unit um, charge. Now, what if there is no visible source of electric field? Is it possible that electric field is created, but we don't really know about um, what exactly is the source of this. For instance, the source can be two different charges and we just don't see them. We only feel the source somewhere out there, which is on the distance from these two charges. What's important is, again, to characterize the field by intensity vector. I don't even know about this, but if I can measure the intensity at each particular point of the space. So now this is the space, and at each point there is something, some vector, which is actually a force on the unit charge. So if I take a unit charge and put it here, it will be either attracted or uh, repelled to a certain direction, which means I can measure this particular force at any particular point. So that's very important. So now we forget about the source of the charge, the uh, source of the field, this initial, and we are talking about only about the field itself, piece of space, whatever part of the space around us, and at each point there is some kind of a vector which is directed into some direction and it has certain magnitude. So if I have an electric charge and I know this vector, I basically know the force. The magnitude will be multiplied by the charge and the direction will be whatever the direction of intensity is. Okay, now, this is in many cases represented as so this constant 1 over 4 pi epsilon is k, where epsilon is a characteristic of a basically a space where exactly all these electric fields are are the, the, where they exist. It can be vacuum, it can be water, it can be glass, it can be anything. So the most important point, part of this case is that I will probably use this particular uh, usage. So instead of K, I will use this. Now, epsilon has it's basically some meaning. It's called permittivity. It's how permissive the space is for electric field. Doesn't really matter. This is the constant. This is the constant. This is the constant for any kind of a substance. There is a K and correspondingly epsilon for a vacuum, for, for air, for, for anything. Okay? So just a constant. But this is more convenient constant, as you will see in a couple of minutes. Now, now we are talking about a field produced by a point charge. Now this field would be obviously radial, either repelling or attracting depending on signs of uh, electricity in the initial charge and in the charge which is our probe charge, if you wish, okay? So, I would like to introduce a new uh, concept. 
I don't really remember if I introduced this concept before when we were talking about electromagnetism, which was the previous part of the course, before the waves, I was talking about electromagnetism and its properties. There is a concept which is called flux. Actually, it's for any field, not only the central field, but for any field. So again, we're talking about space, and at every point we have some kind of a vector, which is a direction of the force. And the magnitude of this vector, it defines basically the intensity of the field, right? So the concept of a flux, in this case electric field flux, here what it is. If you have certain very small, let's say, piece of space, a piece of su a surface, let's say you have a sphere, for instance, you can have any piece of that sphere that we are talking about, or you can have a cube, and let's talk about piece of that cube on the side or even in the angle. It doesn't really matter what kind of a surface this is, as long as it's uh, compact, basically. Now, there are certain um, vectors of intensity which are defined on that particular surface, right? So, if this is a surface somewhere in space, since we're talking about space which is basically a field, which means at every point in space there is a vector of intensity, there is a vector of intensity on every point here, directed somehow, not necessarily radially or whatever. So any surface and any vectors which are basically emitting from it, well, it's not really emitting, it's probably, since it's a field, they're going through this particular surface. And that's why it's called the flux. Now, what's important is that in a very small piece, of that surface, well, obviously infinitesimally small if we're talking about the, the, the real scientific kind of approach. We can consider the, uh, the vectors to be constant within this infinitesimal piece of the surface, and what we can do is we can multiply the vector, which is like one and the same vector everywhere, times the uh, area of this particular um, a small piece. And that's how we will have an infinitesimal flux going through this particular piece. Then we can summarize to, uh, the flux through all these pieces, and as this, these pieces, sizes of these pieces are going down infinitesimally to zero, our flux becomes more and more precise. This is basically the same thing as integration, but we used to have integration of the function. We divide it into small pieces and then multiply the widths of the piece by value of the function, and then as the piece is going down, the whole thing becomes integral. Now this is called a surface integral, basically. But we don't really care about how it's called scientifically, and we will not be talking about very complicated surfaces. The idea is to break the surfaces infinitesimal pieces, multiply, consider that the vector of intensity is exactly the same within each particular piece, multiply the area of the piece by vector, and that's how we get this particular intensity. Now, I did not specify one little thing. The vector can go from this surface either perpendicularly to the surface or at the angle. Now, if it goes at the angle, it's not exactly the same thing. What's important is to have a normal which is perpendicular to the surface and project the vector of intensity onto this normal. So, if you have a vector of intensity, I think I have exhausted this. If you have a, a vector of intensity, This is a very small infinitesimal piece of surface. This is a normal perpendicular to the surface. And if this is the intensity vector, I have to project it and then multiply the magnitude of this projection by this. Because as we know, let's say 
sun which goes perpendicular to the surface hits it much better than if it's under angle, right? So, my definition of the flux is the same as I just mentioned before. You multiply the area, but not exactly by the magnitude of the, uh, of the intensity vector at this particular in the immediate uh, neighborhood of this point, but to a projection to a perpendicular to a surface. Now, what is perpendicular surface? Well, if it's some kind of a tricky surface, perpendicular at any point is perpendicular to a tangential plane, right? So if you have, let's say, a sphere, what is perpendicular to a sphere? Well, you have a tangential plane to a sphere at point, whatever the point is, and perpendicular to a tangential plane would be perpendicular to a, uh, to, 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 um, a sphere, Well, which happened to be a radial uh, line because every radius is really perpendicular to the whole surface in the point where it points. And that means it's all perpendicular. And that's exactly what I would like to use right now for a simple case. What I would like to do, I would like to calculate the flux, which is produced by a point charge um, through the sphere, and the point charge obviously is in the very middle of that sphere, in the center. Now, in the beginning of this lecture, I was talking about, basically talking about um, Maxwell equations in some simple cases. So this is a simple case, and I would like to demonstrate what exactly the first um, Maxwell equation means for that particular case. Okay, so let's just do it. Let's say we have a sphere in the center we have a charge q0 the radius of a sphere is let's say r now since this is a centrally symmetrical figure obviously all the forces are going radial okay so this is the force this is the force etc they're all radial now I'm talking about the surface of the sphere, which means all the points are at the same distance. So R is exactly the same everywhere on the sphere. And I would like to know what is my flux produced by the field um, with, the Q, with the Q0 as a source through this sphere of the radius R. Well, okay, let's bo go back and remember the intensity is equal okay this is my intensity on the distance r from my charge right where epsilon is permittivity of whatever the environment we are in maybe it's a vacuum maybe it's air doesn't really matter whatever the epsilon is okay now What's important here is that at any point on a sphere, my intensity vector has exactly the same magnitude, because R is the same, and Q0 is obviously the same also, and every vector is perpendicular to the surface of the sphere. This is exactly the simple case, because if I will take, for instance, a cube, have a source of electricity here, then one vector to this direction will cross the cube and it will be perpendicular, but this vector will not be perpendicular. And since I'm talking about the flux, and the flux basically is the, the flux on a very small piece here, would be an area of this times projection of the vector of intensity onto the perpendicular to a surface and normal to a surface, then that's a difficult kind of point, which we can do as exercise, but integration would be really difficult. Here, integration is trivial. Why? Because any little piece, if I will take here, will have already perpendicular force. I don't have to project it to anything because 
the force exactly is along the perpendicular to a surface. Force is always normal to a surface, as we are saying, okay? So, and the, all the forces on this sphere are exactly the same in magnitude. So they're all perpendicular to a surface, and they're all the same in magnitude. So there is no sense for me to break this surface into infinitesimal pieces and calculate for every piece and, and, and sum them up together. Why? Well, because if I will sum them up together, the magnitude would be actually, well, it would be like E1 times S1 plus E2 times S2. But all E's are the same, and they all equal to E. So I would take E outside of the brackets, of the uh, parentheses, and S1 plus S2 plus etc. will give me the total area of the sphere, right? So that's why this is a simple case, and that's why I'm bringing it today. So to calculate the flux for the sphere, in this case, it's very simple. I take the magnitude of the intensity vector, and I know it's perpendicular to uh, every piece of surface, and multiplied by area of the sphere, which is 4 pi r squared. And this is my flux. It's a Greek letter phi, capital, by the way. So this is electric field flux, so I will put f uh, phi e. And, um, well, let's see what it is. E is, as I said, so what happens? My 4 pi r square would cancel out, and I will have q0 divided by epsilon. Now, why is this remarkable? It's remarkable because it does not depend on the radius. So, the flux through this surface or through this surface, or through any surface um, of the sphere, no matter how big the sphere is, is exactly the same. And this is quite remarkable. Now, let me give you another more remarkable case. What if Q0 is not in the center of this sphere? Well, what we can do, we can always I, I have not done it in, in, in writing in, in the notes for this lecture, it might be as an, as an exercise, but in theory, if it's not a center, I can always um, uh, put some kind of a, a diameter through a center of the sphere and through a point where Q0 is located, and sum up these two things, small ones. Well, this is a smaller, this is a bigger, which means this particular um, radius, well, distance to a sphere is less than this one, so I will have R1 in one case and R2 in another case. However, what's interesting is that if, um, if I will start summarizing that thing the way how it's supposed to be with kind of a surface integration, so to speak, I will have the same result. What's another important thing is that if I, instead of a sphere, will take a cube, which I was just drawing before, and I will just try to calculate the flux through this particular cube surface, surface of the cube, I will have the same result. So what's interesting is that for any closed surface, whether it's a, a sphere or ellipsoid or cube or parallelogram, uh, I mean parallelepiped, or whatever else you can come up with, even absolutely not geometrically known kind of a form, as long as it's closed completely from all the sides, you will have exactly the same result that the total flux would be equal to this particular thing, the amount of electricity inside of that particular point charge divided by epsilon, which is a characteristic of the space. 
more than that if instead of one point charge you will have 25 you will have exactly the same result this is, will be just a, a sum of all these charges so no matter how charges are distributed inside that surface which is completely enclosing the piece of space you will have exactly the same result the flux from all these charges through this surface would be this regardless of the shape of this particular surface regardless of how big it is how the charges are distributed inside etc and that's a very important characteristic of electric field and this is something which is essentially the first Maxwell's equation now what I will do right now I will try to put that Maxwell's, Maxwell's equation instead of this form which is kind of integrated form into differentiating form and that would probably seem to be maybe a little bit more involved mathematically but um, since it will be differential which means it will be very small well infinitesimally small pieces when we are talking about differential um, you will more um, you, you, you will have probably better understanding um, uh, why we have something like uh, one and the same kind of a law for any kind of shape etc because whenever we are talking about small pieces it's not really a shape which is important and in a differential level the equation would actually mean whatever I'm going to derive right now and then we will see how it looks on a differential level okay so for this we will do the following uh, we will consider a very small piece of space and I will use the cubicle piece of space these are coordinates X, Y, Z, and the cube is somewhere in space. And let's consider that this cube is aligned uh, with um, the coordinate plates. So this point A will have X, Y, and Z coordinates, and the dimensions of the cube would be delta X, delta Y, and delta Z. Well, delta are small. Well again obviously you understand that it will be eventually in infinitesimally small but because they're small I can actually consider the field to be more well uniform so to speak because it's not really changing much okay fine so how can I calculate the flux from this particular field well, let's consider that I have <coughs> certain distribution of electric charge inside that little cube. There is something which is called a density of electric charge. And I call it rho of x, y, z. Now, I assume that this density of electric charge is such that the total electric charge in this cube uh, I will put delta x, delta y and delta z is equal to this rho times the volume so the volume of this cube is delta x times delta y times delta z and if my density of electric charge is this then I assume that inside of that cube I have so much electricity okay so it depends on obviously x y and z and dimensions of this cube well I shouldn't really say it's cube because I did not assume that delta x is equal to delta y and delta z it's parallelepiped All right, fine it's just too long a word so if I will 
call it cube sometimes, and you understand that this is part of the pivot. All right, now, so I know that the charges are inside. This is the total number of charges inside. Okay. Now I do know, basically, that um, as I was saying before, no matter how these charges are distributed, the total flux should be the same, right? But anyway, I'm not right now talking about this. Now we have to talk about um, intensity vector produced by these charges. All right, intensity vector is E of x, y, and z. And again, this is a vector. So at any point inside of that cube, parallel pivot, there is a vector. OK, great. How can I find out? the uh, flux, which is basically I have to multiply this vector by any infinitesimal piece on the, on these, uh, on the sides of this uh, of this parallel pivot. Well, I'll, I'll do it this way. I will represent E as, as E x of x, y, z, E y at x, y, z, and EZ, XYZ, projections of this vector onto each particular point. So any vector, whatever is inside, I can put it as a combination of three coordinate vectors. Why it's important for me? For a very important thing, because now if I want to, let's say, calculate the um, flux which goes through this area, I will use only the component of this vector, Ex plus Ey plus Ez. I will use only Ex because Ey and Ez are parallel to this vector, right? Because if I will multiply E times, well, some, some kind of area S, since E is equal to EX plus EY plus EZ times S, which is equal to EX times S plus EY times S plus EZ times S. But I know that EZ is parallel to S. Now, if this S is this particular side, EZ is parallel. And which means that projection onto a normal, onto perpendicular to a surface would be zero, right? So I don't have this. Same thing with y. If it's along the y, e e y, again, it's parallel to this. So if it's parallel, there is no flux. Nothing goes through the surface. And only Ex actually remains. Which is very important for me because ES, well, first of all, I assume that this particular parallel pipette is so small that my E is basically constant inside it. So the uh, vector here or vector here or inside or wherever it is, vectors are the same. Obviously, if delta X, delta Y, and delta Z are small enough, I can assume that the, uh, the vector of intensity is exactly the same within this small parallel pipette. So E is the same and doesn't depend right now on whether it's inside on the left or on the right or whatever. It's exactly the same everywhere. And if it's the same everywhere, I can uh, calculate flux through this particular area by basically multiplying um, E of x plus delta x uh, y z I'm here, right? I'm talking about this particular thing. So the flux goes here and uh, this value has coordinates x plus delta x but y and z are the same. So that's why I put this thing. I will multiply it by this area, by delta y times delta z, right? The area is equal to delta y times delta z. And this is the flux which goes through this 
right, let's say it right uh, side. So it's a right, left, top, bottom, front, and back. Okay? Six sides. I will talk about each one separately. So this is my flux through the right side. Now, what is my flux to the left side? Well, the um, value of uh, uh, intensity vector would be E of x, y, z, right? This is x plus delta x, and this is uh, just x on the left side. We talk about left side. What's important is these two vectors are basically almost the same. They differ only a little bit. But the normal to a surface is completely opposite. Here normal goes this way. I probably didn't mention it. Normal should go outside of the surface. So if this is the closed surface, normal goes here to the right, and on the left one it goes to the left, opposite. And whenever I'm multiplying using this particular um, formula, uh, my, my vector is this way, but normal is that way. So if I'm talking about projection, um, it will be the same by magnitude, obviously, but it will be with a minus sign. And the area would be exactly the same. The left area is exactly the same, so this is the area. But the flux should be uh, uh, should be using th the amount of intensity with a minus sign because the area is oriented opposite to this one. There are two opposites. So if I'm talking about flux, obviously this goes this way and this goes that way, right? From the central. It goes outside. That's why they're going to different directions. That's why we have to multi we have to subtract them to know what's exactly the total flux. So the total flux in two surfaces, right and left, would be difference between these two guys, right? Which is equal to. Let me divide and multiply by delta x. It would be x plus delta x y z minus. Um, e of x, y, z divided by delta x and multiplied by delta x, delta y, and delta z. So I just multiply and divide by delta x with this difference and uh, uh, combine together this uh, intensity. Now, what is this? I mean, to those who are very much familiar with calculus, and I presume that all my listeners are familiar with calculus. Whenever the delta x goes to zero, we are talking about this thing infinitesimally small, right? This thing, if you fix y and z, that would be a derivative by x. So it's called partial derivatives because y and z. So the total result this would be derivative of e x y z by dx times dx times dy times dz. Well, I actually should put, should put d differential rather than rather than delta. So we're talking about all the delta coming down to zero. So this is actually, whenever this uh, uh, parallelepiped is small enough, this is what I have from right and left uh, flux. Okay. Now what will I have um, front and back? Well, obviously the same thing. I will have d e of x y z by d y. Exactly the same thing. So instead of um, x plus delta x, I would have y plus delta y minus <coughs> minus y, and it would be the same thing. So that would be there. 
and finally the same thing for z by dz great <coughs> so for every small uh, parallelepiped I will have this as a total flux which goes through this parallelepiped and finally I have to uh, I have to summarize it right now you remember that my um, that my initial talk about sphere I was talking about uh, the total flux through a sphere is equal to uh, the um, charge inside flux was equal to charge inside divided by epsilon right okay now and I was talking that it doesn't really depend on the shape, whether it's a sphere or a cube or whatever. In this case, it's a, it's a parallelepiped. So sum of this, the total flux, should be equal to this. And this is, in this particular case, if this is a volume, the volume is equal, by the way, delta x times delta y times delta z, or dx, dy, dz, and I have a density rho, that what I would like to say is that the total result of their sum would be equal to total uh, charge and total charge is equal to rho times dx dy dz divided by epsilon, right? Oh, now, obviously, dx dy dz will cancel out here and I have a very important formula almost finished with this important formula is d e of x y z put d y uh, sorry put dx first plus d e partial derivative by y plus partial derivative by dc is equal to rho divided by epsilon. Nice? Nice. I will make it even nicer. Now, by the way, if you are not familiar with partial derivatives, and actually it's practically the same thing as plane derivatives, with only one argument of multiple argument functions. So this is function of three arguments, but I'm differentiating only by one, basically keeping y and z constant. That's why it becomes basically partial derivative. Now, but um, smart mathematicians or physicists actually decided to do, well, they have decided to basically abuse some notation. They have said that, okay, let's introduce a vector, uh, a pseudo vector, it's not a vector actually, nabla, which is d by dx, d by dy, d by dz. Now, these are operators, but they look like a vector. I mean, it's a basically a combination of three operators written as a vector. Now this is just notation. So nabla is not a vector and it's not an operator. It's just three operators together combined by a couple of commas and, and curly brackets. Right? So it's no big deal. But we can treat it as a vector whenever we do some uh, operations. For example, what is nabla scalar product with vector e of x, y, z? Now, vector x, y, z is basically a combination of e, x, um, 
x, y, z, e, y, x, y, z, e, z, x, y, z. So it's three components, and the scalar product is basically you're multiplying by individual components and sum them together. So this is exactly equal to d by dx e x y z. Now I can put x here, but it doesn't really matter because we are talking about um, differentiating only by x, so it's, it, it would be the same. Plus d by d y e plus d by d z. Now, using this particular notation, you can put nabla times e equals rho divided by epsilon. Now, this is a short notation for this. Now, it's nothing but changing of the notation. There is nothing more than that. But it looks kind of nice. So, this is kind of a scalar product of a pseudo vector and the vector. Okay, so basically that's it and this is something which is basically the, 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 the form uh, of the first Maxwell equation. Um, and I was trying to basically explain it again, I did not prove it in like, like all the different forms, shapes, etc. <coughs> However, I think you have a feeling of what exactly the flux is. And what's important is that the total flux through any closed surface is basically um, uh, can be on, differen on differential level on a very very small surface is equal to a, a density of uh, electric charge inside divided by epsilon. Uh, well, obviously something like a point charge if you take, well what's the density if you have a single point charge in, in a sphere. Well, in this particular point where the charge is, it would be infinite, in infinite, right? So it's an abstraction. But charges are not really point charges. There are no point charges. Charges are always spread around, and we can always talk about density of the charge. It means charge divided by volume within which it's the, the, this charge is located. Okay, in any case, that's not something which you can learn in like university where you have a, a very rigorous presentation of this. This is just to give you a feel of what the first Maxwell equation is. Now read the uh, notes for this lecture and uh, good luck. Thank you.